The Battle of the Coral Sea, May 1942, was the first major engagement in naval history which was decided entirely by air operations. No gun actions between surface ships occurred. The final battle was unusual. Each force tried to destroy the other from the air at the same time. And weather played an important role, seriously affecting the outcome of the action. The battle consisted of three phases. The first phase, from May 1st to 1632 May 4th, covered the Japanese capture of Tulagi, and also the Allied attempt to disrupt this capture through an air attack. The second phase, from 1632 May 4th to 2400 May 7th, covered the action off Masima. One Japanese carrier was sunk. During the third phase, from 2400 May 7th to 2400 May 11th, the double action attack was carried out between the two task forces. One American carrier was lost. The battle was the inevitable result of Japan's desire to extend her frontiers even more to the southward to protect Rabaul and to cut communications between the United States and Australia. The United States determined to prevent this expansion, to gain time to build up strength in Australia and to build up her training and production program. The decisions of the Japanese High Command were influenced by the ease with which the Army and Navy had conquered vast areas in their initial operations. Wake, Guam, Rabaul, Burma. Japan was strongly influenced by the Doolittle Raid of 18 April 1942. This sporadic attack accelerated the High Command plan. This plan was an initial move through the Solomons, New Guinea, and Fort Moresby. If this was successful, to advance into New Caledonia, Samoa, and the Fijis. Later moves would capture Midway and occupy the Aleutians. This, the United States could not permit. It was necessary to turn back the Japanese thrust long before the American training and production program could support this operation. The bombing of Tokyo, although cheering to American morale, was only a nuisance raid. If the Hornet and Enterprise could have joined the Lexington and Yorktown in the Coral Sea action against the three Jap carriers, students of naval history can conjecture the results. The commander-in-chief of the combined fleet was Admiral Yamamoto. Commander of the fourth fleet was Admiral Inoue, who was based at Truk. On being given command of Fort Moresby and Tulagi operations, Admiral Inoue moved from Truk to Rabaul. Unity of command was rare in Japanese joint operations, but in the Coral Sea operation, there was no confusion of command. All forces engaged were naval forces, under the command of naval officers. This contrasted with the Allied situation of divided command responsibility, as we shall see later. What information did the Japanese commander have? He knew that the land-based American Air Force had been increased to 200 planes. Many of these planes had been assembled at Fort Mosby, Hallsville, and Fort Darwin. This figure was reasonably correct for operational plans. He knew it would be difficult to conceal his plans from enemy air reconnaissance. He knew that he must protect himself from low altitude surprise attacks, which had previously been highly effective. He understood that a British fleet had been dispatched to Australia, consisting of destroyers, a light cruiser, two or three heavy cruisers, and one battleship. He assumed the Allied forces would always have battleships with them. In this, he was in error. However, he was correct in making this assumption based on his intelligence. But it resulted in his erroneously reporting sinking a battleship of the California class when in fact no battleships were present. The Japanese commander believed that the American force could not be large. Carriers had not been seen in the southern area since March 10th. American carriers had attacked the Japanese homeland on April 18th 
Allied forces were supposed to have only a few carriers left. Therefore, only one carrier, and that, the Saratoga was in the area. No allowance was made for capability of more than one. The Japanese commander believed that one or more submarines were operating in the Bismarck area. This was partially correct. Four submarines were there. But above all, the Japanese commander noted that transportation of airplanes and supplies to Australia was increasing. The deployment of the Japanese forces was in furtherance of the basic plan to seize bases to the south for protective purposes. The plan scheduled two operations. A minor one, the capture of Tulagi as a plane reconnaissance base, and a major one, the capture and occupation of Port Mosby by sea. The Japanese commander deployed the Japanese naval units into a Port Mosby invasion force and a Tulagi invasion force, all covered and supported by a striking force composed of two first-line carriers, the Shokaku and Suikaku, and screened by two heavy cruisers and six destroyers. A covering force of four heavy cruisers, a destroyer and a small carrier, the Shoho. A support force of two light cruisers with gunboats, minesweepers and auxiliaries. And a submarine force of six submarines and two tenders. The Japanese plan was well considered. By threatening something the Allies valued highly, such as Port Moresby or Tulagi, their strategy was to bring the Allies into a vulnerable position by forcing the Allies to expose themselves. But they underrated the importance of Tulagi to the Allies and were unprepared to strike back when the Allies counterattacked. The Japanese apparently knew that Allied air searches reached their maximum radius 45 miles east of the Solomons. And so, they set a trap. They sent their striking force beyond the range of these searches and clear of the coast watches. They hoped that, unless discovered by a submarine, they would be in position to strike suddenly should the Allies interfere with the Port Moresby operation. They could employ a single or even double envelopment as was tried later at Lady Gulf. They were thinking in terms of land operations. Naval operations often fail when based on land warfare concepts. The Japanese commander was wrong in his estimate. One Allied carrier force, TF-17, was already in the Coral Sea, having entered south of the New Hebrides. A second task force, TF-11, had passed between Epate and Aramanga, 300 miles south of Japanese expectations. TF-11 was ordered to join TF-17 on May 1st. The Japanese High Command was right in the assumption that the Allies knew of their Mosby and Tulagi movements and would endeavor to stop them. However, had they thought in Allied terms, they would have arrived at the Allied capability of striking from the south, where Allied support and freedom of action lay, rather than from the east, where Allied forces would be open to plane or submarine discovery. Also, they would probably have correctly estimated the importance of Tulagi to the Allies. But the Japanese high command remained hopeful of springing their trap. Later, they explained profusely why it failed and how it could have been effective. In reality, their loose front invited destructive blows on weak, scattered detachments. Let us take a look at the Allied command relations. On 18 April, General MacArthur had formally assumed command of the Southwest Pacific Area. Admiral Chester Nimitz, at sink pack, controlled the carrier forces in the Coral Sea. Although Commander Southwest Pacific had no control over these Pacific Fleet carrier operations, he was called on to support them with his search and reconnaissance planes. At the same time, Commander-in-Chief Pacific and Commander Task Force 17 had no control over the supporting air forces under Commander Southwest Pacific. A high degree of coordination was therefore called for, since there was a divided command responsibility. Comso Westpac, in preparation for the support of TF-17 and the Coral Sea, 
informed CTF-17 that he would modify previous search plans to cover these areas once daily. The searches from Townsville would be twice daily. This plan was again modified without knowledge of CTF-17. The enemy areas Buna, Salamawa, Lai, Madang, and Gazmata were frequently covered by photographic and reconnaissance missions out of Port Moresby. Searches from Tulagi covering Solomons and New Ireland ceased May 2nd when the base was evacuated. Searches from Numea were modified by a CTF-17 operation order. What information was available to the Allied commander before the operation? He knew that the Japanese had occupied bases at Rabao, Gazmata, Kaviang, Kaita, Faisi Island, Salamau, Lai. He knew that at Rabao, principal port of convoys, a larger number of transports and supply ships were massing. He had intelligence. The Japanese naval strength was concentrated near Truk or en route southward. This strength consisted in part of Carrier Division 5, including the Zuiakaku, Shokaku, two heavy cruisers from Cruiser Division 5, the Miyoko and Haguro, and six destroyers. Other destroyers in the carrier Ryokaku were also reported to be in the truck area. This information was generally correct, except the Shoho was mistaken for the Ryokaku. None of these Japanese ships were equipped with radar, and none of the carriers were fitted with homing devices. This was not known to the Allied commander at the time. The Allied commander also had information that the Japanese would commence major operations about April 28th with the objective of capturing Fort Moresby and occupying the Lower Solomons by an amphibious operation. Increased air attacks confirmed this information concerning the enemy's intentions. What naval forces were available to the Allied commander? Task Force 17, commanded by Rear Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher. TF-17 consisted of the carrier Yorktown, heavy cruisers Astoria, Portland, and Chester, and destroyers Morris, Anderson, Hammond, Russell, Sims, and Walk, plus the oiler Neosho. Task Force 11, under command of Rear Admiral Aubrey Fitch, TF-11 consisted of the carrier Lexington, heavy cruisers Minneapolis and New Orleans, and destroyers Phelps, Aylwin, Monaghan, Warden, Dewey, and Farragut. Both the Lexington and the Yorktown were equipped with search radar and homing devices. SyncPak had ordered these two to form a single combined force upon arrival at Point Butternut under command of CTF-17. This combined force would have had greater striking power. The merger was not completed until May 6th. From Numea, the oiler Tippecanoe, the cruiser Chicago, the destroyer Perkins of TF-44, joined TF-11. CTF-17 ordered TF-11 to fuel to the maximum. Fueling started 0800, continued throughout the night, was finally completed 1310, May 3rd. This was not reported to CTF-17. In the meantime, TF-17 fueled from the Neosho, completing on May 2nd. The afternoon of May 2nd, a Yorktown Air Scout reported sighting a sub 30 miles from TF-17 and 15 miles from TF-11. It was bombed, but dived and disappeared. CTF-17 assumed that his location had been reported. Actually, the submarine did not report the contact. For 50 hours between May 1st to May 3rd, the two task forces maneuvered at slow speed while fueling in an area of 45 by 60 miles in spite of real submarine danger. Later, SyncPak directed that carrier task forces should change their operating areas frequently and radically from day to day. Although intelligence indicated that the enemy would start operations on 28 April, CTF-17 continued to operate the two carrier task forces 
separately and allowed them to get beyond normal signal distance. At 13.10, May 3rd, TF-11 was fueled and ready to strike. This was not known to CTF-17 because the carrier forces at this time were 60 miles apart and therefore beyond signal range. Radio silence was in force. The Allied plan was designed as a raiding operation. CTF-17 was to keep his command ready for instant action. When a report from Sink Pack or Comso West Pack or his own reconnaissance indicated a fruitful target, he was to take offensive action. This plan was sound, but CTF-17 seemed to underestimate Japanese strength and apparently did not discern the enemy capability of an encircling operation from the east. This nearly led to disaster. The commander of 4th Fleet moved his forces south under cover of land-based planes, reserving his carrier planes for immediate action. This is sound practice, provided land-based air cover is adequate, which was not the case throughout the action. Tulagi was occupied 1100 May 3rd by the Tulagi Invasion Force. Assisting was a covering force on the support force. The Japanese covering force then headed to fuel at Bukka Island prior to joining the Port Mosby Invasion Force. The striking force, en route to its planned position, was 630 miles northwest of Tulagi at time of its capture. It had stopped to transfer to Rabaul nine planes which it had ferried from Truk. And the support force was returning to rejoin the Port Mosby invasion force due to depart from Rabaul 1800 May 4. Had the Japanese command studied the situation from the viewpoint of the Allied commander, they might have realized the importance of Tulagi in the Allied strategic plan and the Allied determination to deny its use to Japanese reconnaissance planes. 1900, May 3rd, CTF-17 received a report from Komso Westpac of the Japanese occupation of Tulagi. CTF-17 then stated, this is just the kind of a report we have been waiting two months to receive. These are juicy targets. He decided to attack without waiting to be joined by TF-11, which was ready, but out of visual signal range. CTF-17 detached the oil in the Osho under escort of destroyer Russell to the May 4th rendezvous to notify CTF-11 and CTF-44 of the designated rendezvous for daylight May 5th. Also to inform them of CTF-17's decision to attack Tulagi. TF-44 was the Anzac squadron consisting of HMAS Australia and Hobart. Did this decision consider the capability of the enemy appearing in the Tulagi area with a strong carrier task force? Should not CTF-17 have designated a new rendezvous in the direction of Tulagi for better support, if support proved necessary? TF-17 reached a launching point 100 miles southwest of Guadalcanal Island at 0700 May 4th. TF-11 and TF-44, 250 miles southwest, were unable to support if needed. It appears to have been CTF-17's belief that he was in adequate strength, and it appears to have been his further belief that he had been reported by a submarine and therefore, his freedom of action would be jeopardized unless he struck immediately. The attack on Tulagi was successful, but CTF-17 nearly fell into a trap because of his relatively weak force. The Japanese did not realize and exploit the favorable military situation they were creating for themselves. A moderate cold front had created a 100-mile span of bad weather south of Guadalcanal. Tulagi itself was in clear weather. This cloud bank was a barrier to Japanese scout planes, yet not too low for homing Allied planes. Hence, was tactically ideal. 
TF-17 profited fully. The launching position for the first strike was correctly chosen. During the day, it would be necessary to work north and then back south to maintain 100 miles between the task force and Tulagi, and the southeast wind would be helpful. But if the enemy was not caught by surprise and made strong counteraction, the southeast wind would facilitate successful retirement. The Rennell Islands might offer some interference to early withdrawal, but bad weather reduced possibility of early discovery by enemy search planes. By 0701, the cruisers had launched an inner air patrol against submarines. At the same time, the Yorktown launched her first attack group of 12 torpedo planes and 28 dive bombers. And for a combat air patrol of six planes working in three ships was maintained through the day. No fighters accompanied the Yorktown attack group because it was hoped to catch the Japanese by surprise. The fighters were retained for the defense of the task force. No strike group commander was appointed because the air group commander was retained aboard the carrier as fighter director officer. Each squadron attacked with little or no coordination with attacks of other squadrons. Thus the air operation lacked an overall commander to reconnoiter the target area, to assign targets and the order of attack, and to observe and report the results of the attack. The Yorktown second attack group was launched between 1036 and 1120. This consisted of 11 torpedo planes and 27 dive bombers. The attacks by this group were not coordinated. The Yorktown launched her third attack group at 1400. This consisted of 21 dive bombers. At 1632, this attack group returned, thus completing air operations against Tulagi. The overall results were disappointing. Torpedoes were dropped at ranges up to 3,000 yards. To the green pilots, the anti-aircraft fire appeared worse than it was. The second attack group expended 13 1,000-pound bombs and 11 torpedoes on a mine layer. But the mine layer was still operable. 13 1,000-pound general-purpose bombs were expended by Squadron 5 on three gunboats. There were better targets for this type of bomb. Proper reconnaissance by a strike group commander could have pointed them out. Evaluation of the damage inflicted from pilots' reports after the battle indicated to the commanding officer of the Yorktown that one CL, two DDs, and one AK were sunk or beached. This was incorrect. From Japanese sources now available, Ships lost were one old destroyer, the Kikizuki, two special duty minesweepers, and one converted minesweeper. Three ships were reported damaged. These were the old destroyer, Yuzuki, the mine layer, Okinoshima, and one small patrol craft. Pilots reported five single float enemy planes destroyed. This coincided with Japanese reports. The Tulagi operation was also disappointing in terms of the ratio of ammunition expended to results obtained. Sinkpack observed that the performance of the Yorktown Air Group showed creditable willingness and effort to keep after the enemy, but there was need for target practice at every opportunity. Meanwhile, CTF-11 approached his designated rendezvous for May 4th. At 0642, he launched a 200-mile air search of six planes to the northwest. He knew of the Port Moresby operation. He did not feel fully protected by the air searches from Australia and did not wish to be taken by surprise. However, he did feel that his northern flank was being protected by CTF-17. At 0800 May 4th, TF-11 rendezvoused with the Neosho and the Russell, and at 0900, with TF-44, the HMAS Australia and Hobart, escorted by the destroyer Whipple, which departed for the New Hebrides. All three groups in company headed 160 miles toward a point southeast of that rendezvous. At 2000, course was changed for the May 5th 0800 rendezvous. Due to radio silence, 
CTF-11 was not informed of the results of CTF-17's attack on Tulagi. CTF-11 did not consider the capability of the enemy opposing TF-17 in strength or the desirability of being in a position from which he could offer some support. If he had chosen a northeast course from the May 4th rendezvous, at 20 hundred, he would have been 250 miles nearer TF-17 and still be on normal range of enemy search planes from Rabaul. Meanwhile, the Japanese command was busy. Although surprised, the forces at Tulagi sent dispatches of their plight. The various Japanese commands began to take measures in accordance with their responsibilities. Meanwhile, the Japanese covering force headed for Queen Karala Harbor, Boca Island for Puli. Commander Covering Force received word promptly at 0915 May 4th of the attack on Tulagi. He immediately reorganized his command into two task groups. One group consisting of the heavy cruisers Kinogasa and Furutaka from Cruiser Division 6 continued on to consolidate with the Port Moresby Invasion Force. The other group consisting of the small carrier Shoho, the heavy cruisers Aoba, Kako from Cruise Division 6, and the destroyer Zazanami reversed course and headed south for Tulagi to track the Allied force. When the commander of the Japanese striking force received word about noon, he increased speed and decided to maintain his southeast course, which would take him around San Cristobal Island. This decision was correct for the striking force was the left wing of the planned envelopment. It is clear that his mission to surprise and contain the Allied force would be better accomplished around the southern end of San Cristobal Island than by a dash through the Solomons. The support force continued toward its invasion rendezvous. This was the position of all forces at 1632, May 4th. 